from cigarettes to alcohol to prescription drugs, illegal drugs, marijuana, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If anything's got control over you and it inhibits you, it ain't making you happy. It ain't giving you joy, but you are a servant to it. I believe the Holy Ghost still sets people free. Some of these things here on my, my prayer list are a result of those chains, of those shackles. You're going to be able to be set free. And our faith needs to be high. Amen. I want to remember uh, Joseph is sick this morning. Brother Johnny's working. I want to remember Michael Martin, Sister Ronnie, Sister Michelle, Sister Bobby, and all the backsliders. Brother Kendall. I've got some friends with some special requests. I've got a couple of friends with very special requests. Salvation being paramount among them. Anyone have a request over here? Sis? Sister Michelle. There's some powerful potential in this place today. Yeah. Some unbelievable potential in the whole place. <laughs> Let's pray with that knowledge and that faith. Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name that's above every name, God, we come before you once again. Lord, bringing all sorts of needs to you, people that are afflicted, people that are addicted, people that are just uncommitted, people that have issues in the life, people that got bad habits of uh, uh, going to wrong places, living the wrong way, uh, motivated by the wrong things. But God, we bring them all to you. We bring them all to you. You're the way maker. You're the healer. You're the deliverer. You're the everything that we need. Lord, you're the peace in the middle of the storm. You're the strength to climb a mountain. You're the strength to swim wide expanses of water. It doesn't matter what we're going through, how many think the valley is. It doesn't matter what the problem is, what the issue is. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. No weapon. No weapon. All things are created by you and for you. Everything is subject. Everything that has a name is subject unto you. Yours is a name that's above every name. And we declare it in the face of every request. We declare it in the face of every opposition. We declare it in the face of every bit of doubt. I'm so happy that I can declare the name of Jesus in the middle of any kind of a crack. Where the name of Jesus is. 
in Sister Terry's class, six, seven, and eight years of age. Sister Barrett's class, nine, ten, and eleven years of age. Amen. 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 That's why I didn't start teaching yet. <laughs> We're going to come to a place in our lives where we really believe everything the Lord says, and it's going to blow our minds when it happens. Amen. Amen. That's what, I, that's what amazes when we completely begin to stand upon the promises of God. I'm going to read you a quote this morning. Before we get started real good, and uh, 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 actually the preface to the message that I want to I want to speak to us this morning. Uh, anybody ever heard of Charles Penny? Anybody ever heard of Charles Penny? He was a he was a, a, a minister, preacher in the 1800s that uh, had, had a tremendous impact uh, upon the religious world. There's a quote that I, that I, uh, I wrote down of his some weeks back, and I, I want to, uh, uh, how many of you are familiar with the term grace, the word grace? Are you familiar with it? How many could give me a definition of what it means to you? I, I know that the unmerited favor of God is what it means, but how, how many really have contemplated and thought? Of course, everybody's heard Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. We, we've sung about it. It's, it's new songs talk about it, but I, uh, I believe, and 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 I, uh, quite honestly, if if I could if I could just preach what Reverend Finney said here, it, it would open up uh, our eyes quite substantially to what grace really is and what grace really does. He said the impression of many seems to be that grace will pardon what it cannot prevent. In other words, that if the grace of the gospel fails to save people from the commission of sin in this life, it will nevertheless pardon them and save them in sin if it cannot save them from sin. Now really, I understand the gospel as teaching that men are saved from sin first 
and as a consequence from hell. And not that they are saved from hell while they are not saved from sin. Christ sanctifies when he saves. And this is the very first element or idea of salvation, saving from sin. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, said the angel, for he shall save his people from their sins. Having raised up his son Jesus, says the apostle, he hath sent him to bless you in turning every one of you from his iniquities. Let no one expect to be saved from hell unless the grace of the gospel saves him first from sin. Amen. The ideology that many have of grace is a skewed one. It's a, it's a flawed perspective of grace. And, and I, 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 I'm, I've got to let you know something. I, I'm a little bit afraid. I, I see it even creeping into our midst and creeping into our church. And, and uh, I, I, I am fearful that we have taken some of the things that I have taught as far as long suffering and, and, uh, and, and patience uh, is concerned. Uh, and we have manipulated them in our minds and in our hearts uh, to the place that, that is where these folks got. I can tell you now that you will never arrive to where God wants you to be by backing down on your commitment, by backing down on your relationship with God. There is no such thing as praying on the curb in the kingdom of God. He will be man to man and require everything. He will require everything that you have to give. The ideology of grace in so many religious movements and, and, and doctrines is one that, that allows me to stay right where I am just as I am because I'm no good anyway. Can I get a witness of that? Grace, a, a, a skewed ideology of grace that it leads me in a place where I can just live like I want to. I, I come to tell you this morning, you will not lessen your commitment to be pleasing to God. The Lord doesn't treat you like you treat your kids. We, we tend to make excuses and we tend to make allowances and the Lord doesn't do that. The book says, and I would dare say there can be an argument made that materialistically we are the most blessed nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth from top to bottom. Even the poorest of our people live better than, uh, than, than, than the virtually the entire world. And the book says, to whom much is given, much is required. Why is it that we have bought into a watered-down salvation or a watered-down ideology of what the Lord expects? And, and, and i got to let you know that we have, we have segued into a place, Sister Maria, where many people think He expects nothing. I've got to let you know something this morning. The Lord gave me this message Friday night in the middle of the church service. I, I haven't preached it, it from this perspective before, but I've got to let you know something. You have got to step up to the plate. It's not enough just to feel good once in a while, but you have got to have the blood of Jesus applied to your life. You have got to do obedience to receive salvation for your souls if you hope to have any, any place or part in eternal life. Moreover, the law entered, verse number 20, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse number 20. Moreover, the law entered. The law was introduced that the offense might abound. The law is referred to the Mosaic law. The law given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai, and, and I have referenced this, I believe, in the last two or three sermons that I preached, that there are, in fact, uh, if I ask you, the, the common person, how many laws uh, are in the Mosaic law, what do we, we most often acquaint the law to? The Ten Commandments, the Tablets of Stone. It's such a big deal that there are court cases about putting it, if it can be left in public buildings, and, and you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not covet. Honor uh, your father and mother that your days may be long, or, or some of those commandments. Uh, but the Mosaic Law, in fact, consisted of 613 commandments, uh, and it was introduced on Mount Sinai in, a, in an awesome display of supernatural revelation at the top of the mountain. Quake and, and nobody else can even go and touch the physical 
Temple Mountain, and Moses was so uh, so uh, uh, absorbed, or, or the power of God was so strong on him that when he came off the mountain, that he had to cover his face up because it shone like the sun. Such was his the strength of his encounter with the Lord. But we have to understand that the law was given, and the law was given with supernatural power. We found out that, that the first tables, Brother David, were in fact written with the favor of God. He, he handed down this law, and, and we've, got to, we've got to come to a realization and understanding that when he says, Thou shalt not kill, and thou shalt not steal, that let us know right or wrong. Right, right. Amen. Because the law was introduced. This is very important. <coughs> Brother Dangsworth, uh, Friday night, got to, got, he always runs late. And he showed up like before almost everybody else did. He's my friend, Brother Jerry Dangsworth, pastors and still many of you know he preached here. Most of them when I'm gone, when he's preached here. And uh, uh, he said, I said, what are you doing here so early? He said, it was a mistake. <laughs> I said, what happened? Did you think it started at 7? He said, no. I think the speedometer's messed up. <laughs> he said, because I was going 70 and flying by people right and left. Just flying by. And he's got a laugh. I said, you, it ain't going to be funny when they pull you over. And you tell them the reason why you was going 100 is because your speedometer said 70. Because ignorance is no excuse. The reason why there's speed limit signs, if there are none, how many of you have been driving down a back road before and, and you're cruising along like maybe at 60 miles an hour, maybe one of those curvy roads like 142 over by Donovan or one of those places and, and, and you haven't seen a speed limit sign in quite a long time and, and you pass a patrolman and automatically you start what? I wonder what speed limit is. Well, what's the limit? Is? What's the last sign that I saw? Oh, God, Because the law sets the standard. And you know right from wrong because there's a law there. Yeah. Amen. That's what the law of God was. It was to establish the precedent as to what is right and wrong according to God. Now the Bible is full of man did that which was right in the sight of God, or man did that which was wrong in the sight of God, or man did that which was right in the sight of man. And there is an incredible difference because the, the emphasis of, of the law, the, the, the law was introduced that sin might be defined. And the emphasis upon the law of the law was upon the offense. Or the sin, and it was to set the precedent for right and wrong. I know Brother Robbie and maybe some others are a student of history, but, but the law of God established a moral code that is, in fact, the foundation for the United States Constitution is based upon the moral code of the Bible because it was our introduction in the world. The law of God was the introduction into the world of right and wrong. Sin wasn't known before the law. At least beyond that which was governed by man's conscience. But the Bible said where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now we have to understand, I'm not going to get into it really a whole lot, but even though we now live in the dispensation of grace, Brother David, it is very clear that grace was present even from the beginning. Grace was present because Brother Larry and Adam and Eve should have died. They should have died right then. But, but you think about it. Uh, Brother Chris, the Lord kicked them out of the garden. And, and then he fixed the way for them to have babies and stuff. And, and there was pain and there was struggle in that. But he also provided joy. And there was pain and the struggle and having to till the ground, Brother McKinney. But he also provided food. <laughs> so it was grace. Because quite honestly, uh, just in what we deserve is to be left on our own. Right. But even though sometimes there's something required of us, if we're obedient to the Lord and we do things the way the Lord intended, there's a blessing in it. Right. The first place we really see a good, clear 
demonstration of grace. It's in Genesis chapter number 6. When the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now the, the plan of salvation from the punishment of the deluge or the flood was the ark. That was the plan of salvation. But please understand that the ark by itself didn't save you. The ark by itself offered no salvation. You got to go in yeah. to be saved. Right. And there was only one way in the ark, and that was the door. Now the reason why there was a flood that came is God changed his mind about making man. He repented that he made man. Because man's, the Bible said that the thought of every man was on evil continually. And that's when the Lord said, I'm not always going to strive with man. I'm all, not always going to work on man to try yeah. to get him to do right. And so grace was introduced. But grace, 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 as marvelous and beautiful and as amazing as grace is, it was forever to be coupled with faith. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. But Noah had to be obedient to the Lord and build in the ark or he would have drowned with everybody else. Grace is forever coupled to faith. Sister Leanne, he only built the ark because he believed God. Amen. God said there's a Don't sleep over this morning. Grace is forever coupled to faith. Forever. Verse 21. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What does it mean to reign? What does it mean to reign? Hang with me now. What does it mean to reign? R-E-I-G-N, rule, the boss. What demands, commands, and governs? What rules, governs, demands, sin reigns, and it reigns unto death, which is much more than just what we lay down in this mortal body, but it's the separation of mankind from his creator. That was a death. That was a separation. That was a hopelessness. No more could Adam and Eve walk in the cool of the day and commune with the Lord, but sin has separated them. And it brought death. I, I, I could teach you a little while this morning on this, but I'm not going to, but I am going to declare it. A result of the sin of disobedience. Now the Lord said you can eat of every tree in the garden except one. And they disobeyed. And I realized something, Sister Maria, at its root. Since the law was given to know right from wrong, every breaking of the law of God at its root is the sin of disobedience. Say, well, killing somebody, that's not, oh, it is in fact disobedience. It's a disobedience to the law of God. So, and we're going to talk about it on Wednesday night, but the Bible tells us that once we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we are to be as obedient children, which really can be boiled down. You know what, Robbie? I mean, we, we call it anything we want, but the bottom line is an obedient child does what you tell them to do. So, our falling in line with you know, every time I, I am amazed when I see once again, Brother David, when Paul said, I, I've espoused you to the Lord. I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I am afraid that as the serpent to beguile Eve, so are you going to be beguiled and, and be deceived away from the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. Because uh, the bottom line is, uh, is if I'm going to be pleasing to God, I have to be obedient to the Word of God. And so many people think that grace has stepped in, so I don't have to be obedient be any longer. That is ridiculous. Yeah. That is asinine. That is just downright stupid. We have got to realize I've got to obey the word of God or I'm not going to be right with God. Yeah. My Lord Jesus, I don't need to be ugly to nobody or nothing, but sometimes we just got to be blunt and plain. We call it fear. We call it whatever we want to. But the bottom line is if you're disobedient to God, that is ignorant. Every now and 
around and give y'all need to shout at something so I can take a break. Hallelujah. There you go. But when everybody goes to holler together, then I can just stop and catch my breath. Look at here. But grace reigns, rules, governs, and demands through righteousness. Grace does not reign through my unrighteousness, but it reigns through, reigns through righteousness, my obedience to the word of the Lord. Please don't, please don't nobody get mad at me. Because I say you know, stupid stuff like that. Sometimes we just not. Sometimes we got to have our cage rattled a little bit. Sometimes we got to we got to say, well, he called me, he called me stupid and stuff like that. Oh, that's not true. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's the world system, it's the world mentality that says I can do whatever I want to, and because of grace, he's gonna save me anyway. Yeah. Amen. That don't even make sense. But the, that, that ideology and that mentality has even crept into our homes. How many times this week have you had kids have you told them, if you do that one more time, I'm going to spike your bottle. And when they did it one more time, you didn't whoop them. But my daddy did it too. If daddy promised you a whooping on Monday and you didn't see him again until Friday, guess what? Friday you didn't get a whooping. But it, that, that, that mentality has crept into our everyday life. That's right. It reigns through the righteousness of Jesus Christ our Lord, which we are to emulate. We are to try that word emulate means to be as good as or even exceed. And as our access uh, is only through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Our access uh, to the relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. Uh, and Brother Larry in John chapter number 10, if you remember Noah was able to go through the door. And in John chapter number 10, two times. Jesus says, I am the door. The only way you're going to be saved is through Jesus Christ. He is the door. The only way into salvation is through Jesus Christ. Amen. The only plan and pattern he gave us is his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. Verse number one, what shall we say then? Six and one. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So, so does grace give us the right to keep on sin? Because, listen to me, does grace give me the right to just keep on living like I want to? Because I can't do right anyway? Is that what grace is? Is, is everything I can't do? So I mean, I'm just going to resign myself. This is the life I'm living. And grace is going to step in. How is it that so many view grace as a license to sin rather than a bridge, which it actually is, Brother David. Grace is a bridge from where I stop and he begins. That's the goal. That's the goal of God, Brother David. How is it? The Bible very clearly says, my little children, I write these things to you, that you sin not. The Bible is not allowing us, it's not, uh, its purpose is not to allow us to, to live in mediocrity or to live short. But we have been called to a higher place to be a peculiar people, a chosen generation, that we should show forth the praises of him who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous life. Uh, amen. amen. I fear that I've been misunderstood, and I think the Lord has brought me this message. Grace is a bridge from our inadequacy. To his fulfillment, but I want to submit to you and think about this. You know when grace kicks in? You want to know when grace kicks in? Grace kicks in when I've done all I can do. 
That's when grace kicks in. It's when I've done everything I can do. Yeah. Because the Lord's not going to do for, think about it just for a minute. And, and this ideology is here too. The Lord ain't going to make you crazy. Right. Amen. The Lord's not going to make you clap your hands. He's not going to make you lift your hands. He ain't going to make you sin. The Lord ain't going to make you preach. The Lord ain't going to make you do anything. But when we submit ourselves to him and become his servants, then we're obedient to him. It's not that he lets me. But Brother Rice Paul was very clear on more than one occasion. I call the prisoner of Jesus Christ. That word would be better translated the slave of Jesus Christ. And it is a willful submission to the law of God. Amen. I've got to come to the realization he knows better than I do. Think about it when you're praying through the tabernacle. And then sometimes, just for it, I get hung up there. But Isaiah 9 and 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Think about it, Brother David. The Bible said he knows the end from the beginning. He is the I am. He which is, which was, and is to come, the Almighty. Why in the world do I still think I keep on doing it my way when his way is perfect? He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. Think about it. Think about it. this week. Twice this week I've heard people say I don't believe you got to do all that hooping and hollering together. <coughs> I'm afraid we're listening to them. Let me tell you something. You get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and it's hot and burning inside of you and they start singing about it, it's the overflow of a forgiven So. Why is it? Listen to me. Mom, it's so right. And it's so powerful. And it's so real in the Bible. And it's so plain. Come on, when the Holy Ghost was first poured out on the day of Pentecost, uh, they talked in other tongues, Brother Chris, as the Spirit gave the utterance. But yeah. people were drawn to them because they acted like they were drunk. Right. Then Peter, of course, did not dispute the fact that they're drunk, Brother Peter. <laughs> they're not drunk. Come on. You need to tell you, you go back to the root of why they experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It wasn't because the Holy Ghost fell. It wasn't because of tongues. It wasn't because of their demonstrative actions. It was because of obedience. Because Jesus Christ said, go ye and tear yeah. it. Oh. He said, go ye and tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. You go there and you went, and the Bible said, and they went with joy. They went with joy into Jerusalem, and they were continually in the temple, praying and praising God. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord, and they were
I die to sin. I die to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. I die to that. Because the Bible says very plainly, Sister Maria, they that are Christ's, apostrophe S, they that belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. I have got to submit myself. Does that mean that when I repent that I can never do nothing wrong again? So when I mess up one time, I'm just going straight to hell? No. It doesn't. Well, we baptize people that ain't got everything straight yet. But you know what they got to do? They got to say, they got to think in their mind, I want it straight. I desire for it to be straight. If not, I desire to hang on to this. I want you to baptize me, but I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing this. I ain't quitting nothing that I want to do. No. I, I don't baptize you. No. Unless it's just real hot and I'm going to cool down a little bit. Because <laughs> that's about all the benefit we're going to get from it. And it'll cool you down now, let me tell you. But I have to come to a decision in my mind. <coughs> Take this whole world. Right. Take this whole wide world. Right. And give me Jesus. Because yes. God forbid, how should we that are dead to sin live any longer than they're in? That's the focus of where am I living? Where am I living? I remember one time somebody told me, growing up, I was a kid. I'm not going to tell you who it was, so don't go even worry about who it is. They told me they was going to do something that was sinful. And I said, you can't do that. That's a sin. And they said, I'll just repent when I'm done. Because I think I'll go on. You're not really repenting. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we sometimes do silly, stupid things. But by the grace of God, I'm no longer resigned to having to live there. And receive the wages of sin because the Bible said it's dead. <coughs> but through the gift of God, I'm saved from the power of sin. From the power of sin, which is to separate. But by the grace of God, I'm able to go from where I'm at to where He is. I don't know if we're receiving that or not. That's what grace does. It takes me from the flesh to the spirit. It takes me from the corruptible to the incorruptible. It takes me from the unholy to the holy. It takes me from the unrighteous to the righteous. That's what grace does. The law of the power of life in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. John 1 17 said, For the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. Grace and truth. Grace is the opportunity. Grace is the door. Grace is what allows us to step in when we don't deserve it. Nobody in the world has ever gotten to the place where God gave you the Holy Ghost because he finally said, well, I guess they deserve it. But that's how we think. If I can be good enough, that eliminates grace. Okay? But i got to stretch myself. i got to press myself. i got to command and demand high things of myself. The Lord is not going to put grace into my life when I'm continuing to willfully be mediocre. The Bible says, I'm not going to be much longer. Sunday school people are going to love me today. Man. Grace and truth. Grace is the opportunity. Truth is the path. Grace gets you in the door, but truth keeps you on the right path. Grace brings you in when you know nothing. Truth reveals itself to you. The Bible says very plainly, this is at first, stay with me, at first this is going to seem kind of unrelated. But the Bible says very powerfully in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 that Paul sought the Lord at least three times to be delivered from a thorn in the flesh. Now, it's, it, is, it is most probable, Brother David, that it, was, that it was some kind of a physical affliction that limited or prohibited Paul. It might have even hurt. Some things you read say that Paul had an eye condition, that his eye ran and looked like he had pink eye all the time. Old Krusty jumped all over, which would indeed make him appear 
uh, grotesque to other folks. But I want you to notice in verse number 7. And Paul said, unless I should be exalted above measure, I want you to keep in mind what Brother David said to us a while ago. Grace wants to keep you from sin. Think about this for just a minute. Think, I want you to think about this. Paul said, unless, or except I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Now let's stop right there just a second. Does anybody want to tell me what that means? Does anybody know what that means? They've got an idea. Raise up a finger like this high where nobody else can see you. But I know that's what you're waiting for. All the things the Lord has revealed to him, all the things that God did through him, have a tendency to puff you up, to make you proud. So except, we're talking about grace. We're talking about grace. What's grace do? If grace is the bridge that takes me from where I can't anymore to where he can. Unless I should be exalted above nature through the abundance of the revelation. Because God's been so good to me. Now, I want you to think about this just for a minute. How is it that the flesh and the devil can take something that God does and cause you to sin? Are, are you? That's what that's saying. The work of the... So, so that goes to tell us that as powerful as Paul was, he wrote over half of the New Testament. This is, this is almost borderline nuts. This is, this is some of the foolishness of preaching. That the grace of God caused something in his life that kept him from sin. Now here's the beautiful thing. And here, here's what we got to grasp a hold of, Brother David. At what point or at what place do we get enough sense, do we get enough spiritual discernment to recognize that some of the things we've been trying to pray out of our life may be there because God wants to keep us in check. And in fact, it's grace manifesting itself. Come on. I feel the whole thing's up in here right now. That it is grace operating in my life to keep me in a place to keep me in a place where God can use me. Because if I am all full of myself and I start thinking it's me that does it and I've seen it happen. That's what happens when a little humble preacher comes up and lays hands on somebody and they're healed and then the Holy Ghost starts working through and then the next time you see them they're wanting to knock people down and wave their toe at them and do all kinds of crazy things. You know, I remember going and seeing somebody before he would pray for folks he got two guys to stand behind him because he's going to fall out. Man, the Lord don't work like that. Matter of fact, the Lord does something like spits on the ground, makes mud, puts it on a fellow's tongue, or put it on his mouth and spit on his tongue, and he said, go wash in the pool of the sun alone, and don't tell nobody. So Paul, the grace of God was operating in Paul's life to keep him restricted. And I, I, I don't know if we received, can we quite receive that or not because we have a mentality that says bigger, 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 bigger. And sometimes the grace of God is saying, stay right here. Stay right here. Because it's here, I can work with you. Because you can't. When you get here, you're doing it without my grace. You have to realize Paul was kept in check by the grace of God. <coughs> it's a foolishness of preaching, can I say? It? Because God's way up is down. The way to exalt it. The way to being exalted is what? Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God. That he may. He will not lift us up, Brother David, until we can handle it. But his grace. 
his grace through him. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. That's Paul's conclusion. Look, it said, verse number eight. For this thing I besought the Lord Christ, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect or complete in weakness. Now, how does that jive? I told you it may well look like it makes sense, but how does that jive with the mentality of somebody that doesn't know the Lord that thinks, I've got to get good enough so he'll like me? No. That's why when you come to the Lord, you come with hands outstretched. You come in your weakness. You come in. You come in your weaknesses. You come in your infirmities. You come in your, your corruption. You're acknowledging to him, I have nothing to offer you. I have nothing to offer you. And that's when he says, now I can work with you. My grace is sufficient. What's that word mean? Good enough. My grace is enough. For my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly. Therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. But what was it that made me that way? The grace of God. It's not Paul's intestinal fortitude. It's not Paul's commitment. It's, it's, it's not Paul recognized. And he said it very plainly. Brother McKinney, I remember you teaching it to us. It's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. He said, whether I or they, so we preached and so ye believe, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen. Grace manifested itself in an infirmity that helped Paul stay in the place he needed to be in order that he might continue his effectiveness for the kingdom. Rest assured it wasn't sin, but that he might not sin. And that did not jive with the Old Testament mentality because the Old Testament mentality said, Paul's done something wrong or he wouldn't have no problem. But Paul recognized, we've got to get to the place where we recognize that the Lord's working in my life and I trust him. Yes. Even if it does make my eyes look jacked up. Even if I do walk through the wind. You think about it. Moses couldn't talk to him. Israel or Jacob walked with a wind. Abraham had to leave what was familiar. He had to offer up his son. David wasn't even tall enough of to be brought up to the courtyard and be checked out for king. That's the purpose of grace. Amen. That we might continually overcome. See? Mm -hmm. yep. My grace is sufficient. What it is, is His grace makes up for my inadequacies. Who I cannot be, grace makes me there. Where I cannot go, grace takes me there. What I cannot see, grace shows me. All has sinned and come short. All has sinned and come short. All has sinned and come short. Grace takes me there. Grace takes me there. It does not leave me where I stop at. But it takes me there. Ephesians 2. It said that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith. 
and that not of yourselves. <clears throat> it is the gift of God. The purpose is that we might be saved. That's why Jesus came. And the Bible very clearly says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, or he shall save his people from their sin. Not in your sin. From your sin. That means he pulls you. He pulls you out of where you are. Yeah. Sin is the separator. Amen. And it's the grace of God that brings us back to him. Right where we belong. We'll keep singing it. Stand with me. Come to the music. Don't go get the children just quite yet. Give us about five minutes. Amazing grace, how sweet the sun. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm mad for the life that now I see. What I want to do this morning, if I can. I really felt this in the Holy Ghost as soon as the Lord gave me this message. I, matter of fact, I put it in my phone and I had to email it to myself and I had to copy and paste it and, and because it, it was just coming. And, and what the Lord is... What the Lord wants me to tell you is there's those among us right now that you want that relationship with God and, and, and you want what you see folks around you have and you like what you feel and, and, and you see it out there somewhere but the answer is I'm not ready I'm not ready I, I really got to let you know that the only place of readiness is when you recognize you've done all you can yeah. I've got to trust the Lord this is where we step in. And faith is coupled with grace. Because grace is the door that allows me to come to the altar. That allows me to come to the altar and repent of my sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive them. Grace is what offers me the opportunity to be baptized in the only saving name there is. Jesus Christ. Grace offers me that. But you know something, Brother McKinney, it just sitting there, the 